Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Glad to have you all here. During the Revolutionary War, the British occupied Newport and most of Aquidneck Island from December 1776 until October of 1779, almost three years. One of the most dramatic events during that time was the capture of General Richard Prescott from the Nichols Obering House, which some of you know as the Prescott Farm. Why we name it after him, I'm not sure. Anyway, it was a bold and audacious effort by uh, some colonial forces. The Portsmouth Historical Society, in cooperation with the Portsmouth Library, are pleased to present a lecture on Barton's raid at Prescott Farm in 1777. Uh, just a side note, uh, because we, as a historical society, are in the process of re-energizing, having increased our membership uh, by about 3,000% in the last nine months, uh, we really want you to know that uh, the more members we get, the more programs we can do. And so if you're not a member of the Historical Society, there are me membership applications up here and outside, and probably someone will hand you one at the door if you don't have one. Our speaker for this evening is Christian McBurney, who has written seven books on Rhode Island and Revolutionary War history, and uh, including, as far as I'm concerned, the best uh, book that's ever been written on the Battle of Rhode Island. It's really outstanding. If you haven't read it, you really should, because it happened here. So those books will be available for purchase, four of them right up here uh, at a special discount price. I'll let you come up and find, try to find out what that is before I say so. Mr. McBurney is also the editor-in-chief of a wonderful Rhode Island history blog, uh, which you can access on the internet. It's called smallstatebighistory.com, smallstatebighistory.com, and that's all lowercase, all run together. On that, you will see a whole collection of various articles on Rhode Island history, and I very much encourage you to take a look at that, and it's updated weekly, just about. Yeah, it's updated just about every week by people writing history of Rhode Island, including there's one there right now. The feature article is one on a incident that happened in the uh, Rhode Island Senate in 1924, I think it was, uh, when the leader of the Republican Party, Arthur Sherman from Portsmouth, Rhode Island, uh, got involved in a situation and someone detonated a, a can of bromide gas in the middle of the state legislature and the Republicans who had the majority by one uh, fled the state and went up to Rutland, Massachusetts and stayed there for six months. It's a really interesting article. You really should read that. It's by Rusty Simone. So it gives me really great pleasure tonight to introduce Christian McBurney uh, for his lecture on Barton's Raid at the Nichols Overing House. Thank you. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here. I've uh, uh, been, I think, my third time here, and I always get a nice crowd, so thank you. Now, how did I select a topic uh, for this book, Abductions in the American Revolution? And it all did start with uh, kidnapping the enemy, uh, the captures of um, uh, Charles Lee and Richard Prescott. Uh, now, in this book, I focused on two of the outstanding speci special operations in the Revolutionary War. The first was the stunning capture of Charles Lee, who was at that time the number two general to George Washington, and at the time he hoped to become the number one general but he was captured at Basking Ridge in New Jersey in December of 1776. Um, here's a picture of uh, Charles Lee here. Uh, he was an odd character. This, this was said to be a, one of the best likenesses of him. So uh, <laughs> he, back then it was very unusual to have dogs as pets and he had dogs as pets. This is uh, his Pomeranian, Spado is one of the first images of a, of a Pomeranian. But once uh, the kind of, kind of guy he was, a woman came up to him, a very genteel woman, and said, General Lee, uh, is it true that you uh, like dogs? And he says, Madam, I love dogs, but I detest bitches. <laughs> so that was the kind of guy he was. This is a, a capture, an image of the capture of General Lee by <coughs> Earl uh, William Harcourt. Does anyone see anything wrong with this picture? Lee, the exactly, the red coat. The red coat should be the guys who are capturing him who have the blue coat. So somebody got a little bit mixed up, but still it's a fun image. Now the second was the bold kidnapping of Major General Richard Prescott, the commander of British troops of Newport. Uh, Barton seized Prescott so that the Americans could have a <coughs> British officer of the same rank and so they would be exchanged. Prescott's raid stands uh, even today as one of the greatest special operations in the Revolutionary War and in U.S. Army history, I would argue. 
uh, and it's the one I'll spend most of the time today. I discovered there was a rich and untapped history of kidnapping attempts against military and civilian leaders during the Revolutionary War, and if I see that kind of gap, I, I get interested. In the Revolutionary War, the main reason for capturing a general or a military leader or governor uh, was uh, to remove that person from being a general or a governor, and also the imprisoned general or governor could um, uh, be exchanged for someone of the same rank. The Roman historian Tacitus once wrote, the principal office of history I take to be this, to prevent virtuous actions from being forgotten. Was kidnapping an enemy leader from his sleeping quarters virtuous? Army officers on both sides thought so, and in their minds, if it helped to shorten the war, it was justified. Washington himself applauded and supported kidnapping efforts undertaken by the American Army. Once when uh, he brought up a plan to kidnap the British commander of New York City, Henry Clinton, he th wrote, I think it one of the most desirable and honorable things imaginable, taking him prisoner. Now, when Charles Lee was captured, Americans knew that he could only be released if the Americans captured a British officer of the same rank. That would mean a British major general would have to be captured, no easy task. One man in Rhode Island took it upon himself to do just that. His name was William Barton. He was born in very ordinary circumstances in Warren uh, in 1748. As a young man, he struggled to be a hat maker uh, in Providence. When war broke out, he joined the Rhode Island militia as a private, but his leadership skills showed through, <coughs> and he was soon promoted to become a lieutenant colonel in one of Rhode Island's two state regiments. So this was not a continental regiment, but a state regiment that Rhode Island formed. Barton had met General Lee when General Lee had visited Newport in 1775 and thought he was a great general. At that time, uh, Rhode Island was being terrorized by um, James Wallace and his ships in Newport. Lee came with 100 Virginia riflemen and, and forced uh, some Tories to take an oath to the Continental Congress, so the Patriots loved that. At the time, uh, when Barton had his great idea, in June of 1777, all of Newport and the rest of Aquidneck Island was under the occupation of a British army of about 4,000 British, German, and Loyalist soldiers. In December of 1776, a powerful fleet of more than 71 ships had carried them to Narragansett Bay, and they easily captured the island. British warships then patrolled Narragansett Bay, not allowing any American ships in or out of the bay. Rhode Island and Massachusetts troops surrounded uh, Aquidneck Island, and Tiverton, Little Compton, and Bristol, but they could not dislodge the British Army. At the time, Newport was one of the five most important cities in the United States. Here's an image of Newport, first dominated by church spires. Who can name the other five cities in, in colonial times at the time of the Revolution that were important? New York, Boston, Boston, New York, New York Philadelphia, 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 Charleston. Charleston, very good, wow. I think that's the most people who've ever said Charleston. That's usually the one that, that tricks people. So. And Newport was right there, for sure. On June 20, 1777, a Mr. Coffin was escorted to Barton's headquarters. Coffin was a civilian who had recently escaped. Um, uh, let's see, okay. He had recently escaped from Aquidneck Island. He had news about Major General Richard Prescott, who had recently assumed the command of the British troops on the island. Coffin reported that General Prescott was spending nights at an isolated farmhouse about five miles north of Newport. It was uh, owned by John Obring. Prescott previously had spent the nights at a house in the heart of Newport, the John Bannister house. Barton then had an idea. He would form a small party of soldiers with experience using boats, not hard to do in Rhode Island. On a dark night, they would take boats across Narragansett Bay, avoiding the British warships stationed there. They would land unnoticed on the shores of Aquidneck Island, sneak up to the Obering house, and surround the house. They would then storm the house, capture General Prescott, and spirit him back to the mainland. Prescott could then be exchanged for General Lee. A very bold plan. It did not hurt that General Prescott was a hated figure in revolutionary Rhode Island. He was a classic petty tyrant. Once, when he interviewed a privateer captain who had been captured by a British ship and brought to Newport, he knocked him in the head and threatened to hang him. Prescott would regularly visit a militia captain, Burrington Anthony, who, of Portsmouth. He was a member of the uh, Portsmouth militia, and, and when the British came, he just dressed up in his militia outfit and just stood there, and he got captured. He weighed about 300 pounds, apparently. <laughs> Prescott would visit him in jail and just shake his fist, and I'll, I'll hang you. 
damn you, and that kind of thing. He was known to strike Quaker men with his cane for failing to doff their hats in respect when he approached. Sometimes even the British felt Prescott went too far. Previously in Canada, Prescott put out a reward of a thousand pounds for the capture of America's best general at the time, that was Benedict Arnold. Arnold, in turn, announced a reward for the capture of Prescott, but it was only half the amount, 500 pounds. <laughs> Even the London newspapers admired Arnold for his cleverness, and Prescott looked like a fool. Now, why was Prescott spending time in the rural part of Aquidneck Island? He wanted to be closer to the action. Most of the raids at this time were in the northern part of Aquidneck Island, while Newport was in the south. So uh, the Americans were focused <coughs> here, and almost in the summer, almost on a daily basis, they might send over a raiding party to raid some of the British outposts. So most, and, and the, the Americans also had troops here, and the British concentrated their troops here, and that's Windmill Hill, that's Port Butt, Butts Hill. Um, so if there was any action, it was gonna be up here. Here's the uh, Overing House here, and of course here's Newport. Uh, Barton received permission from his superiors to execute his plan. He gathered together five whaleboats and 48 picked officers and men. Several men of the raid were men of color. One was David Page, who was either the last of the Pocasset Indians from Massachusetts or from the Narragansett tribe. Uh, the other was Jack Sisson, a slave from Tiverton, who would later become free after he joined the famous Rhode Island Black Regiment. Barton recognized that the weakest link in the British defense of Aquidneck Island was Prescott's reliance on British ships in Narragansett Bay protecting the coast um, of the island. So Prescott had, whoops, sorry. Prescott had um, troops down in Newport, of course, Brenton Point. He had them on the, uh, the east side here. He had them in the north. But he had no troops right here. Instead, he relied on the British ships. These are the actual names of the British ships at that time. But you'll see they're about two miles apart from each other, at least two miles. So Barton hoped not to come within two miles of any ship, or one mile. Uh, Barton realized the flaw, and he planned uh, to uh, uh, take his um, trip from Warwick Neck. Originally he thought about Bristol, but then he'd have to come too close to uh, these two ships here. So then he decided to go from Warwick Neck. He, his men left in five whale boats on a very dark night, and they used Prudence Island as a shield, and then landed right here, um, south of uh, where Prescott Point development is. It was a sandy beach, it was very well protected, it was a high bluff, no one could see them. They walked about a mile. Uh, a lot of that land is in pretty much the condition it was back then, although it was probably more farm back then. Um, and. Uh, He walked across fields, he passed a house. One of the houses was brimming with 12 dragoons, but they were all sleeping. Barton separated his parties, uh, his 48 men, into five different parties, each with an assigned task. Barton took his main party across, mes West, main, across uh, West Main Road, right here, to the Overing House, in single file. There was only one sentry on duty, Walter Graham, and his musket wasn't even loaded, it was later determined. Graham heard Barton approaching. He called out, demanding the password. But Barton boomed out, I don't have a password. I'm looking for escaped deserters. Have you seen any tonight? The ruse worked. Barton was able to approach the sentry, grab his gun, and threaten him with his life if he said a word. Then Barton gave the signal for his group and two others at the doors of the Overing House to break in. It was at this time that the slave, Jack Sisson, probably used his head as a battering ram to break open the front door. Um, he became fam so famous for that, uh, uh, B William uh, Bill O'Reilly is doing a Revolutionary War show on Sunday nights, and uh, he's doing a show just on Jack Sisson. So they had to call the expert, me, and so I'll be uh, one of the um, uh, ones interviewed on, on the show. And so that was fun. Uh, then uh, Barton gave the signal, uh, excuse me, uh, inside the house were General Prescott, his aide-de-camp, Lieutenant William Barrington, William Barrington was the nephew of the British Secretary of War. There was a dragoon sleeping in the loft, and there were several black servants. Overing's wife and pretty daughter were out on Narragansett Bay being rowed around by a British officer. Uh, 
so they weren't home. Barton finally found Prescott's room and put his hand on the, on the groggy general's shoulder. You are my prisoner, sir, said Barton. I acknowledge it, responded the general. Amazingly, Barton's party was able to retake, retrace their steps and their rowing route and arrive back at Warwick Neck safely. With the general in tow, the British fired rockets in the air to try to spot the raiders, but they did not succeed. They were trying to send messages to the ships, but the ships didn't understand what was going on. They didn't have cell phone or even telegraph back then. The raids succeeded. You can see um, this is uh, at the moment where they're taking Prescott off um, from the landing spot. Uh, you can see that it was done in about 1830 because they were wearing hats in, in, like in, in the army in the 1830s. But anyway, it's kind of a fun woodcut. Uh, not only was Prescott surprised in his bed, the Americans, uh, I mentioned Lieutenant William Barrington, um, the sentry as well is kind of a funny story. Uh, years later, one of the raiders sent his son to a school in Vermont, and the teacher was the sentry, uh, Private Graham. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he, he um, was captured he, and went to be exchanged, but he didn't want to be exchanged, go back to Britain and join the army, so he escaped and uh, started a new life here. Of course, Barton and his men were in great danger of being caught, especially by guard boats sent out by the British warships in the bay. If one musket had been fired as an alert, the whole plan might have been foiled. They risked being taken prisoner and put on prison ships in Newport Harbor. Later that summer, due to overcrowded conditions, poor and scanty food, and bad sanitation, dozens of on board the prison ships died. But Barton and his men avoided being caught. When Washington heard about Barton's feat, he gushed, this is among the finest ex partisan exploits that has taken place in the course of the war on either side. The Continental Congress was so pleased that it made Barton a colonel in the Continental Army and ordered that an elegant sword be awarded to him. This sword is now he held by the uh, uh, Rhode Island Historical Society. It's a beautiful French sword. And I did research in, in the book on other swords that were uh, issued, and they all survive in different ways of uh, condition, but this, this was done by a French swordsmith in, in Paris. Of course, the British were humiliated. A British officer in Newport wrote in his diary, it is certainly a most extraordinary circumstance that a general commanding a, four, a body of 4,000 men and camped on an island surrounded by a squadron of ships of war should be carried off from his quarters in the night by a small party of the enemy without a shot being fired. And this is uh, that officer's map Frederick Mackenzie, he was uh, he, he was able to spot the route where they landed. There's the creek. Followed the creek and then crossed the uh, West Main Road right there. And he could tell because the grass was matted down. So this we know the the actual route. British newspapers focused immediately on two salacious points: <coughs> Prescott's shortage of clothing when he was spirited away and rumors of his female companionship in the Overing House. The August 19th edition of a London newspaper reported that rebel troops took him naked out of his bed, not allowing him time to put on his clothes. Another stated that Prescott had retired in the evening with his aide de camp and a sergeant's guard to sleep a mile from his post with a lady, but was discovered and taken by a party of provincials at two o'clock in the morning. Here's a picture of a London newspaper. In little time, Prescott's capture became the subject of verse, song, and ribald jokes, attracting the talented breed, London's epigram writers. The ridicule became too much for King George III to stomach. The public advertiser reported, His Majesty complains of injustice done to Prescott by the news writers. This rumor of royal disfavor you know, caused some concern for a while. But the ceasefire ended with September 20 edition of the London Evening Post. It declared, when General Prescott was taken prisoner, all he was heard to say when the provincials were bearing him on their soldiers, on their shoulders, out of the courtyard of the house was, give me my breeches, give me my breeches. <laughs> With that, English wits returned to their favorite topic. Even the controversy surrounding the media's ridicule became a, a target of humor. This from the London's Morning Chronicle. A general of late has been vilely abused, and without any reason, most falsely accused, for how could a man be neglectful of duty who was taken when storming the Fortress of Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> the London Chronicle, too, capitalized on the fun. On General Prescott being carried off naked, unanointed, unannealed, 
What lures there are to ruin a man, woman, the first and foremost, all the witches. A nymph thus spoiled the general's mighty plan and gave him to the foe without his breeches. <laughs> in fact, no credible evidence exists indicating that Prescott was found with a woman in his bed or that he stayed at the farmhouse in order to sleep with the farmer's wife or his daughter or any other local women. Despite the local legend here in Portsmouth, uh, it was, um, uh, and as I said, he was there to, to uh, be close to the action. And it was extraordinary, however, the freedom that these English writers had at this time in mocking their military leaders during wartime. Now, Washington immediately offered to exchange Prescott for Lee, but General Howe, the commander of the British troops, refused. He had not uh, obtained any word from London as to whether Lee should be treated as a deserter and a traitor. Finally, uh, months later, he got word from London. The king allowed Lee to be exchanged. The two generals were finally exchanged in April of 1778. Barton uh, gained tremendous reputation for his capture of General Prescott. After the war, there were stories of Revolutionary War um, triumphs, and his was always mentioned. Uh, and also after the war, Rhode Island was one of the last holdouts for the U.S. Constitution. Finally, on May 29, 1790, the state convention here in uh, Newport narrowly voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution. Barton was a Federalist. He was a supporter, as was George Washington, of course. Barton was given the distinct honor of bringing the news to President Washington himself. There's a uh, portrait of Barton in the uh, Rhode Island Historical Society. Uh, but Barton tra suffered tragedy in later years, I believe as a result of the pride he took in capturing General Prescott. I don't want to give away this part of my Kidnapping the Enemy book, so you'll have to read it to find out. <laughs> but a little hint, someone did come to his rescue. Other than people who read the book, does anyone know who this is? Lafayette, that's right. In 1824, 1825, he toured each state, and he was celebrated as a hero. And he helped um, rescue Barton at that time. Um, But I uh, do believe that Barton's capture of General Prescott still stands as one of the most outstanding special operations in U.S. military history. It is not treated as such in U.S. Army histories, but it should be. I'm going to be speaking about um, uh, my abductions book, including Barton's capture at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, so I'll make that argument there. Uh, I'm going to discuss a few other prominent kidnapping attempts in my newest book, the abductions book. One of the most interesting ones occurred when John Paul Jones landed uh, his ship near where he grew up, and he tried to capture a local earl who had employed his father. Uh, Jones had hoped to grab the earl in order to exchange him for American prisoners rotting in British jails, uh, but the earl was out of town. Uh, for years afterwards, English mothers, but still Jones was able to burn some ships and he captured some ships later and created all sorts of havoc. Insurance rates went up 40 percent uh, in London. For years afterwards, English mothers would warn their children, you'd better be good or that pirate Jones will get you. <laughs> they have him here as a pirate. He was a member of the Continental Navy, of course. New York City was a target for numerous kidnapping attempts. For most of the war, New York was the British headquarters. Uh, the island was guarded by warships, Manhattan was well protected, but still George Washington on two occasions tried to capture the British commander-in-chief, Henry Clinton. Another time when Washington realized that Benedict Arnold, perhaps the best officer in the Continental Army, had turned traitor, he was devastated. Lafayette even says that Washington cried on his shoulder, but the commander-in-chief quickly recovered his legend legendary composure. He made it known that he wanted Arnold captured, tried for treason, and hanged. This would not be easy, as Arnold had escaped to the safety of New York City. <coughs> Washington assigned the plan to, uh, of the secret operation to a young trusted cavalry officer named Light Horse Harry Lee, who would be the uh, father of Robert E. Lee. Uh, Light Horse Harry, in turn, obtained the services of a sergeant in his re regiment called John Champ. The two men schemed and hatched um, for Champ to pretend that he was to desert from Lee's cavalry regiment, escape to New York, ingratiate himself with Arnold, and join the new regiment that Arnold was raising. He was going to work with Washington spies. Washington had spies in New York City. 
and find the right time to nab Arnold and force him into a waiting whale boat that would take him across the river to New Jersey. Again, I don't have time to talk about all the details, but um, I will quickly summarize. Champ did desert. Here's New York City, and here's where um, Arnold's house was, right here, so not far at all from um, the Hudson River. A great fire had swept, had isolated that house, um, so there was only a few houses there. Uh, so um, uh, they planned uh, the, with Washington Spy to grab Arnold. Arnold every night would go in the back of his house and use his outhouse and uh, walk around a little bit. So they were planning to grab him at, at a most opportune time and then take him through the fence and then into the Hudson River. But, uh, and by the way, this is, this is a picture of John Champ um, escaping from Continental Cavalrymen. They thought he was a deserter, so it, he was able to get away and go to New York. Uh, but the very night that Champ had set for the abduction attempt, General Clinton ordered Arnold to command an invasion force against Virginia. Now Arnold was constantly surrounded by British officers, and he was planning his campaign. Uh, Champ even joined the army and had to go on a boat with Arnold. So he was disappointed. The attempt failed. Uh, Champ later deserted the British Army and rejoined Lee's Legion, and Light Horse uh, Harry Lee informed his troopers that Champ was not a deserter, um, but was a hero. Uh, Washington uh, made Champ retire because if the British had caught Champ, they probably would have hanged him as a spy. Interestingly, Washington had advised Champ not to harm Arnold and to let him go if he put up too much of a struggle. Washington did not want to make a martyr of Arnold. But after Arnold reached Virginia and started a campaign of burning and plundering, uh, Washington ordered that Arnold be hanged immediately without a court-martial if he was caught. In Virginia, you had Governor Thomas Jefferson. He also laid plans for Arnold to be kidnapped. Uh, two attempts were made on Arnold when Arnold was holed up in Portsmouth, Virginia, including one on ships sent from Newport by the French. Uh, according to a senior officer who served alongside Arnold, the traitor always carried a pair of small pistols in his pocket as a last resort to escape being hanged, but he never was caught. Shortly afterwards, Jefferson himself was the target of a kidnapping attempt. He was forced to flee his beloved Monticello, and he came within 10 minutes of being nabbed by British dragoons under Bannister Tarleton. Fortunately, the dragoons did not burn Monticello, and all they did was take some of his fine wine. Um, now, Washington was the target of two kidnapping events, the great Washington. The first occurred in New York City while the Americans prepared to defend Manhattan from an expected invasion. One of the perpetrators turned out to be a member of his own lifeguard, which had been established as his security detail. Uh, this man was hanged. He was the first man to be hanged after being convicted of treason to the United States. One patriot physician, Solomon Drone, Drown of Providence, heard of a report at the time he was in New York City of the vilest attempt ever made against our country. I mean the infernal plot of mayor of New York with a number of villains to have murdered, with trembling I say it, the best man on earth, George Washington. And you hear that a lot, but actually there's no proof of it. The only proof of the plot we have is a statement in a loyalist claim for a pension made in London after the war by the loyalist mayor of New York City, David Matthew. He wrote that he had formed a plan for the taking of Mr. Washington. Now, the British always called Washington Mr. because they didn't recognize him as a real general. So. And in any, <coughs> any event, the plot, uh, which was never that organized, did not succeed. <coughs> now, one of the most fascinating attempts the kidnapping attempts that could have succeeded was made by a German general, Knipphausen, then the commander of the British Army in New York City, against Washington in the winter of 1780. This was one of the coldest winters on record in recorded American history. There were over 20 snowstorms. The Hudson River froze over, you know, something the old timers had never seen before. A bold British officer, John Graves Simcoe, thought of a plan to send dragoons over the ice capture Washington at his headquarters outside Morristown, New Jersey. <coughs> here's, um, so here's <laughs> Manhattan, and uh, the plan was to send dragoons across the ice here and go 30 miles to, to Morristown and back. Um, now Simcoe 
is the same Simcoe you s some of you might have seen in Turn, the cable television show. And there he's, you know, made out to be some crazy nutcase, but in fact he was not a nutcase. He uh, was a very solid British officer. Simcoe wanted <coughs> to send just a handful of dragoons, but General Knyphausen took over the planning and instead mustered all the dragoons he could get, 300 of them. Then he planned diversionary raids along the coast, Vir New Jersey coast. Um, so the plan had a decent chance of succeeding. Washington was staying at the Ford Mansion, which was vulnerable. The Ford Mansion was one mile east of uh, Morristown. So here's the Ford Mansion here, and here's Morristown. All of the troops are to the west, about three miles. Um, and actually, if you have a chance to visit the Ford Mansion, I encourage it. It's a, it's a nice, nice spot. Uh, still, British cavalry would have to ride some 30 miles across roads regularly watched by local militia and Continentals. Moreover, the raiders' escape route would be very long to New York City, a, a fact that uh, enemy alerted troops would know. The weather was also unpredictable and dangerous, uh, so uh, it wasn't a daring proposal. There were some 100 members of Washington's lifeguard at or near the Ford Mansion, uh, but the 300 dragoons hoped to overwhelm them. At the time in early February of 1780, Martha Washington was also visiting. Here's a picture of uh, the Ford Mansion in, in winter. <coughs> On the night of the planned raid, a lucky event happened. It snowed yet again. Niphausen boldly decided two late days later to go with the raid. Uh, the infantry went out, did diversionary raids, but the snowstorm prevented the dragoons from going far. The roads hadn't been cleared. The British um, dragoons' horses would cut through the top of the ice and cut their um, hooves. Uh, we know this because the uh, guide for the dragoons was actually a spy from General Washington. The dragoons, after midnight, returned to their quarters. It certainly would have been interesting if the raiders could have reached Morristown. Would they have been able to overwhelm Washington's lifeguard? Uh, what would they have done with Washington had they captured him? Simcoe said he would spare his life, but if Washington resisted, he would kill him. What would happen if the Patriot cause <coughs> uh, Washington had been captured? The implications are scary to consider. Now, I quote in the book a number of British intelligence re reports on the state of Washington's guard throughout the, the uh, war. For example, in July of 1781, a British intelligence officer obtained information from a female spy who had gained access to Washington's headquarters, probably for being a laundress or a cook. Uh, the woman is returned from Washington's quarters. She saw him herself and says that Washington sleeps in the back bedroom, that there were two French sentries yesterday at his door, that his guard consists of French and rebels, which she judged to be about 30 or 40 men, that she saw no horsemen there, that there was no camp in the rear of the quarters, his headquarters was about a half mile back of the rebel camps. So despite, despite keeping tabs, uh, Washington never again put himself in a position where he could be kidnapped. Now Washington himself sought a very unusual kidnapping of Prince William Henry, who was then just 17 years old. Here he is. He was <coughs> the third son of uh, King George III. Amazingly, Washington ordered Colonel Matthias Ogden of New Jersey to make detailed plans for the attempt even though it was 1782, this was after the Battle of Yorktown. So the Americans essentially won the Revolutionary War after Yorktown, although officially the war wasn't over yet. But Washington wanted to capture the prince. Uh, Ogden <coughs> made detailed plans. Some 30 Americans dressed as common sailors were to land on Manhattan Island, uh, the southern part that I showed you. They would brazenly march through Wall Street to nab Prince William Henry. Uh, if they had been caught in any disguise, they would have been hanged. Prince William Henry was not really a military officer. He was uh, um, serving as a cabin boy on, on, on an <coughs> admiral ship. According to an observer who saw the prince in New York, one of his favorite resorts was a freshwater lake in the vicinity of the city, which presented a frozen sheet of many acres and was strong with the younger part of the population for the amusement of skating. As the prince was unskilled in that exercise, he would sit in a chair fixed on runners, which was pushed forward with great velocity by a skating attendant while a crowd of officers environed him and a youthful multitude made the air ring with their shouts for Prince William Henry. Now the British discovered some boats on the Hudson River and they became suspicious. And so um, they took extra safety precautions and the planning ended. A half century later, Prince William Henry became King George, uh, the King of Great Britain. Um, 
The U.S. ambassador to Great Britain showed the king a copy of Washington's March 28, 1782 letter addressed to Colonel Ogden. The letter said the prince, when seized, should not be hung. That's what Washington said. Reading this, the king said, I am obliged to General Washington for his humanity, but I'm damn glad I did not give him an opportunity for exercising it towards me. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, one, one's, one's wondered why Washington did this. Um, you know, he, he might have done it to uh, perhaps uh, uh, trade Prince William Henry for thousands of sailors who still were in terrible British prison ships in, in Brooklyn. Um, but you could imagine the, the reaction of the British if they heard that Prince William Henry had been captured, they might have said, well, forget ending the war, we're gonna carry on and our honor's been stained and we're gonna continue with the war. Um, but fortunately, uh, the attempt was never made and shortly after that, the British um, uh, agreed to end the war and started negotiations. Um, now, uh, Whig leaders such as Governor Livingston as well as George Washington typically went to great sacrifices, um, putting themselves in a position where they were vulnerable to being kidnapped. In taking such precautions, they performed a substantial service. Uh, by contrast, General Richard Prescott, who was captured by Barton, um, argued that he kept only nine privates and a corporal as a guard at her nearest quarters because he didn't want to take away troops from the northern part of Aquidneck Island. Yet his capture was a big blow to the British, so that was not a good excuse. Charles Lee had a similar situation. The multiple attempts to capture Governor Livingston must have worn him down. In August of 1782, a friend of his suggested that the two meet at Livingston's house. You're seeing me, my house is impracticable, the governor complained, as I have not for some years been able to live under my own roof on account of the attempts to kidnap me. Now, General Washington summed up the sacrifice that patriot leaders had to bear in a February 2nd, 1788 letter to Governor Lind, uh, Livingston. The commander in chief wrote that the threat of kidnapping was a tax, however severe, which all those must pay who are called to eminent stations of trust to serve their country. Thank you. We have some time for questions, so please. Sure, I'm glad to take some questions. Um, <coughs> is this the house that the general was captured? Yes, this is the, uh, what's called the uh, Overing, Nichols Overing House. It's not the same. It is the same house. It's in an excellent oh, condition. Some a little, some it's not a little, the little one. one. That's yeah. where I think Admiral Hall had the guard. That's, uh, the, 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 that's the Admiral's yeah. re renting the place. Okay. It's owned by the Newport Restoration Foundation. So several of Foundation. us live, uh, live at Prescott Point, and mm -hmm. uh, the screen will now be very interesting because it still yes. runs through the... Uh, I mean, looking, if you go to the standing from the park, it looks very similar to the way it would have looked back then. Exactly. Um, and uh, I'm happy the development was pretty well done, so that, that keeps a lot of it intact, I think. So. Yeah. yeah. Now, interestingly, um, um, the house itself is in Portsmouth, but part of the park is in Middletown, so it's right on the border. But the house is in Portsmouth. <laughs> Early in the war, General Charles Lee was definitely the number two general. Um, but as the war progressed, it was clear that Nathaniel Green uh, was, you know, very talented. And he was the best American general during the war, I think. Um, and so he, they say that eventually he became the number two, and that if Washington, you know, something had happened to him, that he wanted Nathaniel Green to take over. There's not much evidence of that, but it was a good judgment in any event. Why was Prescott, why was it named Prescott rather than Barton? Good point, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What happened to Overing? Overing was a Tory who uh, so supported the British and his family supported the British and he, he um, eventually fled to uh, uh, a Caribbean island and passed away. Barbados, and uh, he had a son who joined the uh, British Army, became an officer in the British Army. Uh, so that was. Uh, he was a wealthy merchant. 
Yeah, sugar sugar merchant. He had a daughter who married a, an American, and the daughter's portrait is in the Brooklyn Museum of Art. So that's that's kind of fun. Where were General Generals Lee and Prescott held after they were captured, and how long did did the exchange uh, take place after Prescott was captured? You have to read the book for all that. <laughs> <laughs> read the entire, or tell you that. Uh, Lee was kept in New York City, and he was under constant threat of being hanged because they wouldn't, he had been an officer in the British Army. Um, but ultimately, it was decided um, that he had resigned. Also, the Americans threatened retaliation if he was harmed. So he was, uh, he was kept uh, uh, for a year and a half. My next book is actually about Charles Lee. Um, he uh, committed treason. When he was a prisoner, he actually f wrote a plan out that said that, that advised General Howe how to defeat the Americans. It was crazy, and it was only found out about 1860. And then, uh, but then he commanded um, the American army at the Battle of Monmouth, and he was after that court-martialed and suspended from the army, and he never joined the army again. And uh, you know, there's a famous scene where Washington supposedly yelled at him. I actually argue he did a good job at the Battle of Monmouth, and that it was unfair for the court martial. That's the next book. But thank you very much. Appreciate it. Just one final comment that might not be terribly uh, clear is that General Prescott uh, got back in the British Army and was second in command of the Newport, of the British troops in Newport at the time of the Battle of Rhode Island, which was about a year, uh, just almost exactly a year after he had been captured. So he, he was still around and, and still as obnoxious a personality that he had been before. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. Really appreciate that. I hope you all will buy lots of books and also sign up for the Historical Society. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Portsmouth Historical Society was established in 1938, uh, from it, and the main building that it has is donated by the Union Congregational Society in that year, uh, and it was organized at that time. The uh, location of the Historical Society on the corner of Union Street and East Main Road was once a, the Christian church in Portsmouth. Uh, there, were, there was one church built here in 1824. And then another church was uh, th that was torn down. Actually, it was has moved this corner of the it was, property uh, where we have not only the church, uh, this one was but built we have in the orig uh, school, original one-room schoolhouse built in 1725, and we also have the original town hall from the early 19th century. This church was used by the society until it disbanded in 1939. Um, that was the um, Union Society. Various people have preached in this church. There are the uh, pulpit behind me was carved by one of the ministers, uh, Reverend Miller, at one point, uh, which is quite an extraordinary piece of, um, of carving here. You can see it here behind me. We have the communion serving over here, and we have a lot of the Sunday school records and uh, congregational hymnals and things like that from the church back then. And the, uh, among the people who spoke here were uh, William Ellery Channing, who was a minister of the Park Street Congregational Church in Boston back in the uh, 19th, early 19th century, who had a summer home nearby at Oakland Farm, and also Julia Ward Howe, uh, the author, uh, the poet who wrote the Battle of Him of the Republic as a poem, which was later set to music. She lived down Union Street, just a little ways down here. The organ in the church here that was, uh, was here was brought in 1902 from Emanuel Church down in Newport. Uh, it must have been a rather huge project to, to move this thing. It's, it's gigantic. And I'm sure that when it was played, the whole building just shook because of the uh, size of it, all these different, different pieces. 
uh, it's really quite an extraordinary thing, both artistically and uh, um, for the purpose it was used. However, unfortunately, it's not been restored. We it's been talked about restoring it many years ago, uh, but it proved to be a gigantic expense to do so. Um, but it really is quite, quite nice with the, all the lettering and, and flowers and things like that on it. There is a pump behind it, a handle that was attached to a bellows, and while the organ was being played, someone was back there pumping it, just like you may have seen in the 19th century. That's what they, how they powered these things. This room is what we call the Julia Ward Howe room. Uh, there are quite a few pieces of furniture and so on, like the bed and the chair, that came from the uh, summer home of Julia Ward Howe. She had several homes. She had one in Newport, but she also had one in Portsmouth. Her basic location was in Boston. Uh, we have a, a picture of her over here, or several pictures of her around the room. Uh, and the bed, for example, the chair, I believe the sewing machine all came from, uh, from her home on Union Street, which is probably about, oh, about a mile from here, a little bit more than that. In, uh, at the turn of the last century, Dr. Benjamin Green was a physician in town, probably one of the three or four physicians uh, in the town. Portsmouth was a very small town then, probably with about, oh, 2,500 people or so in it. Uh, and what, we, what he did when he died was his medical equipment was left to the historical society. And, and here it is in this case here. Some of it, by modern day standards, is relatively primitive, but it is really kind of interesting to, to see what a doctor um, used for equipment and bottles and scrub brushes and all kinds of different things from that particular period. What we have here is a display of including the painting of a woman by the name of Sarah Eddy, who was a, an important person in Portsmouth's history. Uh, she was an artist and she ran what was called a social studio in the town where children could go to learn proper manners and, and things like that. It, there's quite a display of her, her work here. Uh, recently a television show was done by the Historical Society on, uh, on Sarah Eddy. Her house is still here in the town. There aren't any descendants of her, but uh, it's really quite an interesting uh, person in our history. Who She wrote quite a few books too, um, self-help kind of things. Uh, which is very good, and so she was, but she was an artist as well. She was a painter. Also in the museum, and among the other artifacts that we have here in the museum are a number of uh, Revolutionary War cannonballs. We had a battle of, in, during the Revolutionary War right here in Portsmouth, the biggest battle in New England, actually. Uh, the, big, the last battle in New England, not the biggest. And uh, we have cannonballs from that. We have uh, various other artifacts from World War I and World War II. We have quite a few other things um, some ancient uh, Indian stones that were probably used for grinding. Um, we have ship models. We have uh, Victrolas and radios and, and all sorts of early artifacts from, uh, from local history. Uh, we also have a lot of toys that are here from early in the 20th century. And I mean, the history of Portsmouth goes back to 1638. So we're in our 377th year. And so none of these artifacts go back quite that far, but it really is kind of a, a unique museum for us to have here. This is a chickering piano that uh, dates back probably to about 1858, 59. Uh, it has incredible artwork on it and inside it. It has ivory keys, uh, which is really make, makes it pretty unique. Uh, it's a, a beautifully piece, carved piece of wood, and the, um, it's just one of the real treasures that we have here. One of the uh, really unique things that we have here in the Historical Society Museum is this hearse. Uh, it's a hearse, most churches had their own hearses uh, back in the 19th century. And there was some discussion as to whether or not this one belonged to this particular church. Uh, that's sort of been downplayed, but, but what has been decided is that because this was donated to the society in, in 1943, and at that time it was about 75 years old, it goes back to about the 1870s or so. Obviously, it's in need of rather significant restoration, but, uh, but it's really quite a, a unique thing to look back into the, the uh, 19th century and, and see it. It's really uh, quite a, a special um, artifact that we have here. Uh, it isn't too difficult to put your imagination uh, to use and, and try to figure out how this was used, when it was used, and so on. The, uh, the southernmost school that was distinguished from the northernmost school when they were authorized by the council back in the uh, early 1720s. 
This building was built in 1725 and served the southern part of Portsmouth. Needless to say, Portsmouth had a very small population at that time because this school building was used for all education from, well, from first to eighth. It's been restored. We have quite a few uh, old desks here from different vintages. Uh, the four that are in the corner over there are, from what we can tell, is fairly early. Uh, I, I, think I always have to be careful about earliest. Um, but the, and the building itself uh, is probably the oldest in the state of Rhode Island, the oldest school building in the state of Rhode Island, and possibly the oldest, uh, there's some consideration it might be the oldest in the country. A book was written about one-room schoolhouses a couple years ago, and this one was uh, featured in it. We had uh, displays and pictures and so on of that. But it is quite unique, and we have the teacher uh, sitting up, standing up at the, at the front, and we have the stove in the middle, which uh, kept everybody warm in the winter time. And it was, uh, the building itself was located at the far end of the street it's on now, which is Union Street, and then it was moved to a farm and used as a tack shop on a farm until 1952, at which time it was donated to the Historical Society. It was restored with the help of a foundation, the Champlain Foundation, in, in the two, year 2000. And so it's quite a treasure to have this here. Uh, it's very unique. What we also have in the entryway of the school is uh, a wall which has not been repainted because it has quite a bit of uh, graffiti on it with a number of uh, uh, initials and some dates that go back to 1882 and so on. And those, it's, the graffiti carries over over the door frame on the right, uh, to the right of it. Um, but it is quite uh, interesting and we are pretty sure it, it's original stuff that we have. Please visit our museum at the corner of East Main Road and Union Street. We're open from 2 to 4 p.m. every Sunday until Columbus Day. Don't miss History Comes Alive at the Portsmouth Historical Society Museum. Meet some of the people who are part of our proud heritage. Sunday, August 21st, from 2 to 4 p.m. at the museum at the corner of East Main Road at Union Street. Please visit our museum at the corner of East Main Road and Union Street. We're open from 2 to 4 p.m. every Sunday until Columbus Day. The Portsmouth Historical Society is supported by a hard-working group of volunteers. Please become a member. If you have a few extra hours, please volunteer to help on one of our committees. It is truly a rewarding experience in helping preserve our history. Go to www.portsmouthhistorical.org for more information.